rejoice with our Creator and celebrate the gifts around us. God of grace and glory, who made all things well, how majestic is your name throughout the universe. In Jesus we are called to endure and to hope. Let us give thanks for a faith that brings peace as well as progress. God of grace and glory, Savior of your people, how precious to us is your gift of Jesus Christ, your Son. The Holy Spirit is present within and among us to guide and direct. Let us listen so that we may hear and do what is true. God of grace and glory, ever present with us, how reassuring is the love with which you envelop us. And now coming together for our unison prayer. Amazing triune God, reveal to us in more ways than we can count. Yet binding in unity all that was and is and yet shall be, we worship you, source of mountains and seas, giver of light and darkness. We marvel at the work of your hands, reconciler and redeemer, Christ our Savior. We are awed by the forgiving love that draws us to you and empowers us also to care for each other. Spirit of truth, whose guidance is available to us every day. We rejoice in your transforming presence. Try you, God, bless we pray, this gathering of your disciples. Amen. And now may we come together for the singing of the Gloria Patria. <laughs> I can 
move it all around the place. And before it just fell, but now we can do all that. How come? I'm not touching it. Well, how come it's doing that? I have a magnet on the other side, so I got a magnet. And so with the magnet, I can do all of this stuff. And without the magnet, that word flip just it falls right to the ground. So you can't see, you know, the magnet holding it, you know, it's behind the paper, and you can't see the force, but there's something that's holding that there and moving it all around like that. And I want to talk about that unseen force like that, because we're talking already, you've heard the first reading about the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit fills this place, the Holy Spirit fills us. Never seen the Spirit, don't even know what the Spirit looks like. There's, there's uh, stories in the Bible where it looks like a bird, like a dove from like Noah's Ark and all that, but I don't really think the Holy Spirit of God actually looks like a dove. But there's this idea that this whole world is filled with the Holy Spirit. Your whole spirit, your whole soul is filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't see it, but it has a force on you, just like this magnet has a force on this, okay? And so Jesus, before he went off to heaven, he says, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to be with you, to live with you. And that Holy Spirit is going to give you power. It's going to give you strength. It's going to give you the ability to sense that I'm here, even though you can't see me. You're going to be able to feel me. You're going to be able to, oh, be able to see the difference that I make. All right? And so the thing is about this magnet is if I hold it over here, this, do you think it's going to do anything with that? Is it going to, I wish it would. No, it's not strong enough. So you have to be close for this magnet to work. If it's not close, this magnet isn't strong enough to do anything. The same thing with the spirit. You've got to let the spirit come in close for it to be able to power us and fill us with that energy that God gives us. If we leave it far apart, like if we don't give God enough chance for the spirit to come in close, God's power can't really work in us as well as it should. So we've got to get close to God. And so when we get close to God, it's just like this magnet. Okay, that's when it can work, when it's close to us. So we're going to try in church and in Sunday school, the good things that we do, we're going to try to get close to God so that the power of God can work in us and through us. Okay, have a great Sunday school. Oh, schedule change. The gift of love right now. Okay, so today, right now is the gift of love. Now our time for 
sharing our prayers. Um, let me begin by again, we'll continue with our prayers for Ukraine. Um, it's sad to read in the paper that you know, they're, they're begging for uh, more and more weapons on the Ukrainian side to offset the more and more weapons that Russia has available uh, so that they can you know, somehow keep their country. And I don't even know what to pray at that point. Do you pray that they get more and more weapons? Uh, because I, I fully understand why Ukraine wants to uh, fight off the Russians, but do we as a Christian congregation fight for more and more weapons, or do we you know, pray for some kind of gift of peace? I, I don't know, because I, I fully support what Ukraine is fighting for, but the idea of fighting and praying for weapons, it just, just doesn't seem to fit in with a, a church service. But I'll leave that, guys, up to you, because I don't know what to pray for with Ukraine. But I do pray for peace in the world, not only in Ukraine, but all these places where there's so much violence and, and so much killing and so much money and effort goes into creating better tools to kill. Uh, if we just take some of that and redirect it in a more positive way, uh, it would be so much better off. But we just can't seem to learn that lesson. So let us pray for peace in the world and that God guide us because we're not doing a very good job at it. We also continue to pray for our nation as we face the reality of persistent and institutional racism. And we pray for the 538 million people who've been infected by COVID-19 worldwide, 85 million of them right here in our country, and the 1 million 7,000 people who have died in our country to date. Uh, so are there any other joys, celebrations, concerns you'd like to share publicly before we act happen? We have a visitor today from Orange and uh... So, welcome, Will. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, express that he loved the song that was sang and that uh, he'd like prayers for Texas, the nation and the world, and prayers for the town of Orange uh, that had a very large fire uh, Saturday the 4th. It was last, last Saturday the 4th, not yesterday. Because it, it was in the paper with that, that big yes. factory building on West River last week. We will definitely keep you in the town of Orange in our prayers. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> um, anything else you'd like to share at this time? Yes. Um, Sunderland lost its oldest resident, Helen Rodab, passed away, 103 years old. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, when did that happen? Um, I think the obituary said she died uh, last week. They own Demo's restaurant. Yeah. yeah. Long time, long time county. Yeah, no, uh, I, I sometimes go to the South Jersey Post Office just to see Ronnie. <laughs> you don't go for the stamps, you go for Ronnie. <laughs> yes, Judy. Our grandson had a higher journey eight this week. All right, happy birthday to your grandson. All right. Any other prayers, joys, celebrations? Okay, then we're gonna to turn to our yellow form. And again, remember we're, we're broadcasting to FCAT, so we're just saying first names. So let us pray for Alan, Alice, Andrea, Art, Bill, Bonnie, Carrie, Cheryl, Cindy, Denise, Evelyn, Janet, Jeff, Jeff, Jimmy, John, June, Lisa, Lori, Melissa, Michelle, Crew and Mark, Richard and Sue, Cheryl, Steve, Thelma, Denny, Virginia and Richard, Wes, Wink, victims of violence everywhere in the world, those affected by natural disasters around the globe, and we pray for peace on earth. And at this time, um, May we just have a few moments of silence in the midst of our public worship uh, to say to Jesus the things that we choose to keep crying. A few moments of silence. Spirit of truth, you open to us the word of life that is Jesus' ministry and his preaching, and help us to see the possibilities that are present in each day on this God's good earth. 
Guide us now so that we may hear your truth and live it to the best that we possibly can. As we face suffering in our lives and also tragically throughout the world, help us to endure, to hope, and then to act. Grant us wisdom and strength of character to overcome our former limitations so that we might represent you well each moment of our lives, doing the work that you inspire us and empower us to do. Guide us as we offer our prayers. Help us to hear heaven's answers. And let us cherish not only what our prayers may accomplish, but also the privilege of being in conversation with God. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And let us now come together in sharing that prayer that Jesus gave to all of us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Gospel is taken from John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. 
15. And Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. And for this reason I said that he will take what is mine, and he will declare it to you. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be accepted to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. This past week, I, I went for my annual physical, and I have, a, I have a slew of these fun socks that my daughters gift me on Christmas and birthdays and, and Father's Day. And when I was getting dressed for the morning of my appointment, I went through them all, and I chose a, a pair that showed all kinds of donuts. And I, I love donuts. And Amanda's boyfriend was visiting his family down in Connecticut. When he came back last weekend, he brought me two donuts from where he used to live. And they were delicious. I guess he knows. You know, being good with Amanda, you got to be in good with the dad. So he brought me two donuts. If you really wanted to butter me up, you could have brought a half a dozen of donuts. I love donuts. And I figured I would wear donut socks to my appointment because I knew who my not doctors anymore, physician's assistant. I knew I had this young physician's assistant. And I wanted to let this young physician's assistant know, as soon as he's coming in, that we got to assess some parameters here. I know it's my annual physical, but you know, you get into the gown, and so you take off your clothes, and you're standing there in your gown. The only thing that the doctor can see is your socks. And so I came in wearing these donut socks to make sure we're not going crazy here, doc, or whatever you call a physician's assistant. You know, I'm not giving up my occasional donut and going only with carrots and celery sticks. I want you to know I really like donuts. And it's at times like this when I realize that there's a, there's a strange relationship between me and my body. It's mine. I wear it all day long, every day, year after year. But when it comes time for that annual physical, it's like me and my body were in a competition. And my doctor, or the PA, whatever you call a PA, He's the one calling the game between us. It's like we're competing against each other instead of playing on the same team. You know, this body is me. I am my body. And so when I treat my body to a donut, my body is just, hey, Randy, thanks, that was great. And I go into that doctor's office, and all of a sudden my body turns against me and says, hey, doc, I never told that guy I wanted that donut. There's this competition going on, and it's all in me. And truth be told, my cholesterol numbers, they should come down. And what do I do, though, even though I know because it's been years and I should be bringing my cholesterol numbers down? And I don't even know if this makes a difference or not. But I eat better for two days or so before I go to my annual physical. I figure if I eat for two days before my physical, maybe my numbers will come down a little bit. I try to fool the doctor because it's me against my body. And he's calling the game. But if my numbers are artificially low for the lab test that I take at my annual physical, and they weren't, they were high again, but if they do get lower because I take a few days off and eat the junk that I shouldn't be eating, well, who loses? Is it just my body or is it me? It's, it's, my body is me. And so I go into that annual physical, I really should do nothing out of the ordinary so the doctor can tell me how to take care, better care of this body of mine because it's not two of us like, fighting against each other, it's only me. And so I've got to get that into my head, but after 62 years and I don't know how many annual physicals, it hasn't sunk in yet. And then today, we have a picnic at the other church. And there's hot dogs at picnics. I love hot dogs, too. And so, thank God that the picnic is this week and not last week, because last week would have been prior to the annual physical, and then I may have refrained from having a hot dog. Now I can have two. So I just do not listen to what I'm saying even here and now. And I've also got, now, I've got my hamburger socks on, because <laughs> I'm going to a picnic today. So it's sort of interesting, the way we talk about our bodies. Or at least the way I think about my body. There's a, there is union, but there's also this idea of separation. And they dwell together simultaneously. And oh, by the way, 
Today is Trinity Sunday in the church. You know, it's pretty confusing when we speak about union and separation in our own bodies that we know intimately, that we share every day, every moment. But it's there. I don't know, maybe as much in your life, but it is there in mine. So let's be humble when we talk about God as Trinity, as union, at the very same time that we're talking about separation, as God as three in one, but also one in three. Let's try and not be overwhelmed by what is unimaginable to us because we're talking about God, and God is not us. You know, in quantum physics, in the regular old world that we live in now, not God's supernatural world, but in the world that we try to live in right now and explain right now, it is proven that forces, which is pure energy, that this pure energy creates particles, and particles are the beginning of stuff, and particles they can become mice and mountains and planets and galaxies. All of that stuff begins with no stuff. All the stuff begins with no stuff. And this is not God. This is not Genesis. This is our real world and real science. Quantum physics also offers the possibility, and this isn't supermarket tabloid front page news either, that there are uncountable, unimaginable numbers of universes and because there are so unbelievably many of them, and again, this is science, this is not whatever you know while you're waiting in line to pay at the grocery counter, you know, those magazines, there. this is not that, this is real science, that just because of that probability, there is another Randy Calvo out there somewhere, just like there's another one of you out there somewhere in another universe, because the probability says that with all the chances, I get recreated out there somewhere. That blows my mind. I cannot imagine. I don't believe in it, but quantum physics says that that is a possibility. It sounds preposterous, but this is a real possibility in our real world because quantum physics is just plain weird in how it explains reality. Never mind something beyond reality. So when the real world is strange, explicable but not really understandable, I think we can give ourselves some leeway in trying to understand the how of the Trinity. And we can instead meditate upon the why of the Trinity. For all the complications of the how, the why is really simple. It's straightforward. It's because in our Christian faith, we talk about God being so blessedly close to us that we had to figure out some way that God could be transcendent and God could be other and that God could be as personal as Jesus walking in his sandals in Nazareth, and as personal as I was trying to show the kids that that force of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, is right here with us now, this close. No difference between that idea of me and my body. That's what God says in the Holy Spirit. We are that close, God and us. And when Christians were trying to think about this why, how that God and us could be that close to God could still be the God of all the universe, the almighty God, and yet the humble God. That's where the Trinity comes from, the why. So the first believers in Jesus, they were struggling with who Jesus was. They had no difficulty in calling Jesus teacher. They witnessed his miracles, his power. They saw Jesus as a man of God, a wonder worker, a prophet, even the Messiah. But the thing is, Jesus referred to himself more often than not as son of man, and son of man is just a fancy way of saying you and me, a human. And so for everything about Jesus that was exceptional, and there was so much, you know, and that set him apart in a certain sense, Jesus instead emphasized his connection with us, his ordinariness, his, his us and him being together. And this is the whole point of Jesus' birth and life, his connection with us as one of us. And Jesus goes out of his way to create a connection with ordinary us. You know, Jesus does not linger and hang out with kings and priests. He doesn't hang out in palaces and temples. Jesus seeks out the lost, the forgotten, the spies, the poor, and even the sinner. Jesus was open and affirming long before we ever came up with that idea. He once told a would-be follower, foxes have their hole, birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus, Jesus is saying, I'm basically homeless. I'm wandering around preaching the God. I have nowhere to lay my head. At another time, 
he had to make a, uh, an example of uh, you know, paying taxes to Caesar. And he wanted to make the, the point by using a Roman coin. He reaches into his pocket. He doesn't even have a coin. He has to ask the ones who are asking him, can you, can you lend me a coin so I can show you what I'm talking about? He doesn't even have a coin in his pocket. Nowhere to lay his head. Not even a coin in his pocket. Jesus does not come to only associate with the upper crust. Jesus comes to be with the masses. All of us. That's that emphasis upon the ordinary. To connect and to touch all of us. On my bookshelf at home, I have a copy of the 10 volume Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. And they're on the bottom shelf of my dictionary. Because if I put them up on the top, they're so heavy, it's going to knock the whole kit and caboodle thing over. And I have them there. And they're big and they're fat. And they're laying on their side. And they stand 20 inches tall. I measured the other day. There's 20 inches tall. If you take out your New Testament here, and you were to measure the New Testament in this Bible, remember, these volumes that I got at home are, are wider and longer than this. But if you took the New Testament out of here, it's a half an inch, a half an inch. And I've got 10 volumes at home that stand 20 inches that are bigger than this, all to explain those few words that Jesus has in the New Testament and about Jesus in the New Testament. And so Jesus comes with this profundity that leads to 10 volumes on the words that are in that one half inch New Testament. He comes with that profundity, but Jesus is known as a storyteller, as a teller of parables, because Jesus wants to make sure that ordinary folk, not only scholars, but ordinary folk, can know about the power of God and the wisdom of God, just like the scholars can. So this ordinariness of Jesus it was what is so exceptional about Jesus. God and Jesus enters our world as one of us and for us, but the same exceptional ordinariness, it's difficult for those first believers to comprehend because he's emphasizing his ordinariness, it's difficult for them to understand all that Jesus is. And this is why today, on Trinity Sunday, we have readings such as we do. There is no explicit, theolo there is no explicit Trinity theology in the Bible. It would literally take the church 300 years, three centuries, to figure out the Trinity. And this mystery was already being felt by the last evangelist. John's gospel comes towards the very end of the first century. So Jesus has been dead for about maybe 65, 70 years by this time. And John is still pondering who Jesus is. And in John's gospel, we get this, this amazing passage that we just read from Jesus saying, I still have many things to say to you. Remember, this is 65 years after Jesus has died. No other gospel evangelist has said this. John says in Jesus' words, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot comprehend them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will then guide you into all truth. So even at the end of the first century, the evangelist is saying in the words of Jesus, you can't understand everything yet, but be open to the spirit. And that still happens in 2022. We still don't get everything about Jesus. Be open to the Spirit. Let Jesus guide us still. Let the Holy Spirit give us that grace and that power so that we can see better who God is. This is why we couldn't celebrate Trinity Sunday until we first celebrated Pentecost Sunday. The Spirit, the living, abiding, still speaking presence of God among us helps us to fumble our way forward about the how of the Trinity. But the most important thing of all is the why of the Trinity. That is that Jesus and that Spirit and that God, the Creator, all of that stuff is so close to us. Christianity celebrates the blessed mystery of the closeness of God. And somehow everything that God is touches us and holds us, talks to us, and gathers with us. And this is that extraordinary ordinariness of Jesus' life and also the promise of Jesus' Pentecost Spirit. So maybe we don't need to linger too long on the how of the Trinity, but let us try to ever cherish the why of the Trinity, which is the closeness of God that we share in and celebrate right here, right now. And for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. And our hymn of closing, if you are able, I ask you to please stand. It's Red Hymn number 242, Holy Spirit, Truth Divine.
Congregation, an official congregation open and affirming within the UCC, and also to vote on whether uh, you like this idea of earlier, which would be an hour or even earlier, 8 a.m., or would like to stay with the uh, traditional 11 o'clock, uh, that's completely up to you. And so we're going to be talking about that in a second. Uh, but right now, uh, I'd like to uh, have our benediction, and we have our congregational response, and then I'll turn it over to John, our moderator. God's love has been poured into our hearts. When we give it away, we discover that we have even more for ourselves. The blessings of creation, the gospel of Christ, the abiding truth of the Spirit, they all guide us and enrich our lives. God has shared with us the graces needed to be God's co-workers. Wisdom continues as our partner in the sacred act of recreation. Let us praise the one who has dominion over all of creation by how we choose to live our lives and express our faith as Christians and as church. We have accepted the grace and peace of Christ in our worship, and now let us be ready to love and serve the Lord in all that we do among all who we may be. Amen. Thank you for joining us, Will. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. I really did. It was a great message today in service. It was meaningful. You could hear everything, I trust. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.